Well, hello again, everyone, and welcome to the next installment in our Cosmic Adventure Astronomy Lecture Series. My name is Dr. Valerie Rapson, and I am the Director and Astronomer of the Dudley Observatory. Today, we're going to talk all about the summer night sky. Summertime here in the Northern Hemisphere is a great time to go outside and observe the stars. There's lots of easy to find patterns and constellations, and of course it's warm out, so we don't mind going outside and checking out the stars late at night. So today we're going to talk about different constellations and recognizable star patterns that you can find in the sky, as well as some of those faint fuzzies, those nebulas and star clusters that you might be able to observe with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. We'll begin our lesson with the same slide that we've started all of our previous seasonal constellations. This slide reminds us that depending on what time of year and time of night you go outside, you're going to see different stars. In our picture here, we've got the sun in the middle of the solar system, the Earth orbiting around the sun counterclockwise as viewed from above, and on the outside we have a variety of different zodiac constellations that are visible in the evening sky. In the summertime, the stars at the top of the diagram are the ones we're going to see. So that's constellations like Scorpius, Sagittarius, Capricorn, and many others. We're going to talk all about a lot of different constellations today. One other thing I want to remind you about about summertime is that, of course, it's very warm and it's much more pleasurable to be outside looking at the stars at night, but we also have to wait longer for it to get dark out. The sun is up for a much longer time in the summertime, which is partly why we feel those warmer temperatures, but it also means that we're going to have to wait until 9, 10 o'clock at night for the sun to go down, and ideally you want to go out an hour or two after sunset to really get the best view of the nighttime sky. So it's kind of a trade-off. It's nice and warm and easier to go outside, but you have to stay up a little bit later to be able to check out those seasonal stars. Let's start by talking about the most easy to recognize pattern of stars in the summertime sky, the summer triangle. If you head outside right after sunset in the summer and you look towards the east and northeast, you're gonna find three very bright stars that make a giant triangle across the sky. The brightest star is going to be Vega in the upper right hand corner of the triangle. Head down into the left, you'll find Deneb. And then down to the right, towards the east, the point of the triangle here, a bright star called Altair. So Vega, Deneb, and Altair, if you imagine connecting each one of those dots, you're going to get a large triangle in the sky. As you can see, there are other stars uh, within the triangle, but these are the three brightest, and it will definitely be a very obvious triangle to view in the sky. Now, each one of these stars is actually a part of its own constellation and I will overlay the three constellations here onto the diagram. Vega is part of a constellation called Lyra the Harp. Deneb is the tail of Cygnus the Swan. And Altair is often thought of as the eye or the beak of Aquila the Eagle. So we're going to explore each one of these different constellations and talk specifically about some interesting stars and objects within them. And we're going to start with the constellation of Lyra. So Lyra, as I mentioned, was thought to represent a harp in the sky. Ancient stories tell us that the harp was a handheld harp made by Hermes. It was given to Apollo. And when Apollo played the harp, the harp was so magical that it was even able to charm inanimate objects. So when he played the harp, the trees and the grass and the rocks would all sway to the music. We can take a look at our diagrams to try and figure out exactly how to connect the dots to make Lyra in the sky. Lyra is really a, a trapezoid shape of four bright stars. Then you connect up to Vega, the brightest star here. And if you want to extend the constellation, there are two other bright stars that you can imagine making a straight line across the top. The picture on the right shows an image of Lyra in the sky. So the bright star up here is Vega. Here's that trapezoid shape we just pointed out. And then you can see one of the stars that you might connect to Vega here to make that line across the top. 
if you're looking at the picture either on the left or the right and, and kind of squinting and going, well, that doesn't really look like a harp to me. I definitely agree. And that's totally okay. These pictures that were imagined in the sky are not necessarily all connect the dots type of pictures. The ancient Greeks and Romans looked at a region of the sky and imagined a, a character or, or an object up there, but they didn't always just play connect the dots with the, the stars and imagine you know, exactly what that picture looked like. So in this case, you are supposed to imagine a harp in the sky, even though the stars don't necessarily trace out what you might imagine an actual harp to look like. Now, Lyra has some really interesting objects in it. We're going to talk a little bit more about the star Vega, and we're also going to talk about M57, which is a planetary nebula that sits between the beta and gamma stars on the trapezoid of Lyra. We'll start by talking about Vega, which is one of the brightest stars in the summertime sky. If you head out in the evening and take a look in the east, Vega will likely be the first star that you notice, unless there happens to be a bright planet in that part of the sky as well. On the right hand side here, we have an actual picture of the star Vega. It's a bright white or blue star. It's about two times the mass of the sun and sits only 25 light years away, which is relatively close compared to many of the other stars. Now, Vega is a very important star for astronomers because it provides the zero point to their magnitude system. Let me briefly explain to you what this magnitude system is that astronomers have. Basically, astronomers wanted a way to use a simple set of numbers to describe the relative brightness of different objects. The bottom image here shows you a range for the magnitude system. It goes from about minus 30 to positive 30, although those are not hard cutoffs on either end. That just happens to represent about the brightest and the faintest objects that are visible to us in the sky. And the way the magnitude system works is every object is assigned a number based on how bright it is. Now things are a little bit weird because the magnitude system actually uses negative numbers for brighter objects and positive numbers for dimmer objects. So if you take a look here, we have objects like Venus and the moon. Venus has an apparent magnitude of about minus four and a half. The full moon has an apparent magnitude of like minus 12, so that would make it brighter than Venus in the sky. And the sun, of course, is very, very bright. So it has a, um, an apparent magnitude of something like minus 27 or minus 28. It's the brightest object we have in the sky. Going the other direction here into the positives, you can see fainter objects. So stars like Vega, Vega happens to be zero magnitude. And then the faintest stars or objects we can see with just our eyes are about positive six magnitude. The brightest quasars, those are distant galaxies, they sit at about positive 12. And the faintest objects we've ever observed with telescopes are about positive 27, 28, and even fainter than that. The bigger the telescopes we build, the fainter the objects we can see. A difference of one magnitude works out to be about two and a half times brighter or fainter than the next object's magnitude. So if I have a star of zero magnitude, a star of minus one magnitude is going to be two and a half times brighter than the star of zero magnitude. Now to situate this system, we have to pick an object that represents the number zero, right? We have to have a point where we start and say that object is magnitude zero. Anything brighter than that object is going to have a negative number. Anything dimmer than that object is going to have a positive number. And the star Vega has been historically used as that zero point. So when we look at Vega in the sky, whatever its brightness is, and unfortunately it actually does change a little bit, and we're going to talk about why in a moment, um, but we look at the star Vega, whatever its brightness is, that is technically zero magnitude, and then we can compare the brightness of other objects to Vega and assign a magnitude number to them based on how bright they are compared to that star Vega. 
So that's in very basic terms how this magnitude system works. And Vega was chosen as the star to be that zero point, that starting point for the apparent magnitude system. Now I mentioned that Vega actually changes brightness a little bit, and that has something to do with this weird infrared glow that happens to surround the star. So as astronomers started to build infrared telescopes, they took a look at some of these bright stars in the sky, and they realized in particular that Vega glowed a lot brighter in the infrared than we would expect a star of that size and magnitude to glow at infrared wavelengths. You can see that in the images here. The picture on the left is a 24 micron image of Vega, and the picture on the right is a 70 micron image of Vega. So we're looking at the star at different wavelengths. Longer wavelengths mean more into the infrared range. Uh, shorter wavelengths mean closer to the visible range of the spectrum. Notice that Vega glows really brightly at 70 microns, and definitely bright, but maybe not quite as bright at 24 microns. What does this mean? Well, normally when we look at stars and we see them glowing in the infrared, it means they're young. It means they're surrounded by uh, a disk of gas and dust and debris that is glowing at infrared wavelengths. The stars themselves, especially stars as big as Vega, generally don't glow very brightly naturally at infrared wavelengths. They glow more brightly at UV wavelengths. So it's the gas and dust and debris around these stars that will glow at the infrared wavelengths. But based on other measurements that we have, Vega is fairly old for its size. It's definitely not super young uh, and actively forming a planetary system, at least not as far as we could tell. So what's going on with Vega? How do we get this really bright infrared glow around it? Well, the type of infrared light that we see gives us a clue. The brighter it is at longer wavelengths, the larger the debris that must be around the star glowing at these infrared wavelengths. So astronomers started to take more images, they started to do some computer modeling, and they realized what's happening with Vega is that it's not super young, it's not actively forming a planetary system. What we think is that it actually has a debris field around it from collided planets. Here we have a, a cartoon that kind of shows what's going on. Take a look at the circle on the left hand side. Here Vega is in the center represented by the green dot and in this empty dark region here there might have been some planets that formed millions of years ago around Vega that we don't currently see. Around the outer edge of the system here there's this cool outer belt. This outer belt seems to contain large chunks of material likely from planets that collided, got destroyed completely, and now we're essentially seeing an asteroid belt around Vega. And it's that asteroid belt that's glowing in the infrared. So not the star itself, it's all this debris that's out at the edges. To give you a comparison on the right hand side, we are showing our solar system. This picture is blown up four times larger than the actual solar system so that you can see on an analogous scale what we think is happening with this debris field around Vega compared to the Kuiper belt, which is the debris field around the edge of our solar system. You can see that the, the thickness here is about the same for the Vega system as it is for our Kuiper belt. But in reality, the solar system is much smaller. The solar system shown to scale compared to the Vega system is down at the bottom. So moral of the story here, Vega has this ring of debris, rocks essentially, from planets that collided early on. And it's this debris field, it's this asteroid belt that's glowing in the infrared. And it's on a much larger scale than the asteroid and the Kuiper belt within our own solar system. That's what's causing that unique infrared glow. Let's move on to the next interesting object within Lyra, and that's M57, the Ring Nebula. 
Remember that the ring nebula is right in between two of the stars in the trapezoid shape within Lyra. And the ring nebula is actually a planetary nebula created when a star similar in size to our sun ends its life and starts to shed its outer layers, pushing that plasma out into outer space. The ring nebula is a really beautiful object that you can spot with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. It's about 2000 light years away. And this star started shedding its outer layers over 7000 years ago. And we are still seeing this leftover material glowing brightly today. The pictures on the bottom here are really cool. On the left, you have a visible light image. This is what the Hubble Space Telescope sees or a small telescope might see. Now, if you happen to have a pair of binoculars or small telescopes, you'll see this structure, but it's not going to be quite as large and you may not see the colors. When I have kids looking through telescopes looking for the ring nebula, I often have them look for the gray Cheerio. That's what it looks like, a little gray oblong circle up there in the sky. Now, the ring nebula in the infrared looks a little bit different. Take a look at the picture on the right. Here you can see that kind of eye-like shape in the center. And then there's this flower-like pattern around the outside. That is infrared radiation from material that was expelled earlier on in this mass loss episode. So when stars finally end their lives and create a planetary nebula, most of the star's plasma is released. That's what we are seeing on the left-hand side. But prior to that, there are smaller mass loss episodes where the star doesn't let go of all of its material. It just lets out a small amount. And that's what we see here uh, that makes this flower shape in the infrared around the outside. This material surrounding the nebula is now glowing because of the UV radiation from the central material traveling outward, heating up that plasma and allowing us to see it at infrared wavelengths. So by using these two different telescopes, we can get a really good idea of how stars end their lives. What are the different stages and episodes that they go through in this process? Now, one final thing to note is that when a star ends its life in this planetary nebula phase, we often think about a spherical explosion or a spherical mass loss. With the ring nebula, it actually created more of a cylindrical shape. And in the image on the left, you're actually looking down the cylinder. So this nebula is tipped in such a way that you're not looking at it from the side, you're actually looking at it from the top down. So that circle that you're looking into here, you're actually looking down the cylinder of this star that has expelled all of its plasma into space. So this is a really cool object and I encourage you to go outside and see if you can spot that little gray Cheerio in the sky. Our next constellation within the Summer Triangle is Cygnus the Swan. And this one is a little bit more of a connect the dots style constellation where you can imagine a swan in the sky. Taking a look at both the diagrams here, the way to find the swan is to start by finding Deneb. That's one of the stars in the Summer Triangle. And then look for some fainter stars that make a giant cross in the sky representing the body and the neck of the swan, and then stars out to the side to make the wings of the swan. Of all the stars within the constellation Cygnus, Alberio, the star that's the eye or the beak of the bird, that is the most interesting star to look at in the whole constellation. So we're gonna focus on that one here next. So Alberio is actually not just one star, it's a pair of stars, and it's very easy to tell that it's a pair of stars if you have a, a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. Looking at these two stars, the first thing that you're going to notice is that these two stars are very distinctly different colors. We have an orange supergiant star right next to a massive blue star in the sky. You can see that in the picture here. The orange star is very bright, and the blue star next to it is also very bright, but slightly fainter. 
stars that have become super giants that are on their way towards ending their lives. They have puffed up a bit. And even though they're technically a little bit cooler when it comes to temperature, they're a lot brighter. They're a lot more luminous because they're physically larger in size. So the orange star is gonna look a little bit brighter than the blue star. And if you are able to take a look at these two stars, it's just so cool to see the distinction of color. You'll really be able to notice a bluish white star and an orangish yellow star right next to one another in the sky. Now, when astronomers first looked at Albireo, the stars were so close together that they naturally assumed that this was a binary pair. A binary star system means that you have two stars in outer space that are physically close enough together to be bound by gravity. And if you watched them over a long period of time, you would actually see the two stars orbiting around one another. But astronomers weren't 100% positive. This pair, Albireo, the two stars didn't seem to really move much relative to one another. So astronomers really weren't sure if this was a true gravitationally bound binary or just what we call a, a visual binary. When two stars happen to look like they're close together in the sky, but they're not actually bound together by gravity. So how do we figure out if it's actually a binary system? Well, we have to do some measurements of their distance and their motion to figure out if they're actually close together and orbiting around one another. There's this really awesome telescope called Gaia that's able to very precisely measure the distances to stars and other objects in the sky. Gaia data shows that both of these stars are within 300 to 400 light years away from the sun, which means that they could be fairly close together to one another. And if they were both within this distance range, they would have a very long period of 100,000 years it would take to orbit around one another, which is partly why we haven't actually seen them orbit one another yet, it just takes a very long time. So this was our first clue that this might actually be a binary system. But our next measurements actually change our minds, make us change our minds. When astronomers measured what we call proper motion, how the stars are moving relative to one another in the sky, they realized that the two stars in Arbirio are actually moving at very different speeds in completely opposite directions. If this truly was a binary pair, then the two stars would be moving together around the Milky Way galaxy. But as you can see in the diagram here, the orange star is moving to the bottom right in that direction in our diagram at 16 milli arc seconds per year. Don't worry about the whole milli arc second thing. You can just think of it as a, a speed. How quickly is a star moving per year? And the blue star is actually moving in the other direction towards the bottom left in this diagram at only one milli arc second per year. So the stars are actually moving away from one another. They're not orbiting around one another. And we don't really have precise enough data to show that they are actually right next to each other in the sky. So our ultimate conclusion is that these two stars are actually just a visual double and not a true binary star system. And this was literally only realized a few years ago. For a long time, we thought Albireo was a true binary, but it's very likely only a visual double pair of stars in the sky. Our last constellation within the Summer Triangle is Aquila the Eagle. And remember that Altair is the bright star at the bottom of the triangle that helps you find where the eagle is in the sky. So in our diagrams here, you can see Altair might represent the neck or sometimes the eye or the beak of the eagle. You've got stars that span to the left and the right for the wings of Aquila the eagle, and then some stars that go down for the tail. Some interesting things you can look at within Aquila. Altair itself is pretty cool. We're gonna talk a little bit about that in a moment. 
And we don't have time to cover it today, but there is a, a star cluster. It's called the wild duck cluster. That's right off the stars that represent the tail of Aquila. And uh, you can definitely check that one out with binoculars. It's a really cool cluster of thousands of stars packed together in the sky. Really neat object to see. But let's look at Altair in a little bit more detail here. Altair is a really interesting star, in part because of how quickly it's rotating on its axis. The star itself is about 1.8 times as massive and 11 times as luminous as the sun. So it's a little bit bigger and brighter than our sun is. And its rotation rate is a really, really high, a lot higher than we would expect for stars. Altair is rotating at about 286 kilometers per second, which means it spins around once on its axis, once every nine days. That's about three times faster than our sun rotates, and it's rotating so quickly that it's actually getting squished. It's actually flattening at the poles. Now, this naturally happens when you have an object that's not a complete solid that's rotating really quickly. Conservation of momentum says when you spin up really fast, you're going to start to flatten at the poles and bulge out at the middle. That's exactly what Altair is doing. The picture on the left here, this gray image with the grid overlaid on it, it's actually a real image of Altair. It's very difficult to get actual direct images of these stars, but because Altair is really large and fairly close, we can actually get an image of the surface. So that white and gray that you see in the background is actually a real image of the star. And you can clearly see that it's not round. The rotation axis is out to the right here. So the star is flat at the top and the bottom and sort of bulging out at the sides. It's rotating so quickly that it's getting close to a rate where if it spun any faster, the star would actually fall apart. If the star spins at about 400 kilometers per second, that would actually cause the star to start to fly apart. Gravity wouldn't be able to hold the material together anymore. So we don't think this is going to happen with Altair, but I'm just bringing up the point to show that it's you know, rotating so quickly it's getting flat, and it was approaching the point where had it rotated much faster than this, we would have started losing material from the star. The picture on the right is just a, a cartoon of Altair and a real image of our sun uh, showing kind of a comparison of size and shape. So our sun, of course, is a sphere, and Altair is kind of a, a squished star, a squished blob of a star in the sky. If you look at Altair with a telescope, you're not usually going to actually see the physical squishing. It's so far away that unless you have a really powerful array of telescopes, you're just going to see a pinpoint of light in the sky. But when you do have an array of telescopes and we can get a direct image of the star, we can actually see that it's flattened at the poles. We're now going to move away from the Summer Triangle and look at a couple other constellations in the summertime sky. First up, Hercules, our hero. To find Hercules in the sky, you want to find that bright star Vega. Remember that bright star that's part of Lyra the Harp? and look up and to the right for what we call the keystone, the trapezoid shape that represents the body of Hercules. There are some other fainter stars that go up and around uh, that are meant to represent the arms and legs of Hercules. And it's totally up to you how you imagine Hercules, whether he's standing straight up and down or sideways or upside down. I've seen the picture drawn every which way, but the keystone is meant to represent the body of Hercules. And the Hercules cluster, M13, is a really cool star cluster that we're going to talk about in more detail in a few moments. So here's the cartoon of Hercules on the left and a real photo of the Hercules stars where we've connected the dots a little bit to show you where it is in the sky. The stars in Hercules are definitely going to be fainter than the stars uh, in the summer triangle. So just be aware of that when you're trying to find this pattern in the sky. So let's talk about that cluster, M13, the great cluster in Hercules. So M13 is a globular cluster of stars. 
If you watched one of our previous lessons, we talked about uh, globular and open clusters. And if you didn't, no big deal. We'll remind you now what these clusters are. A globular cluster is literally tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of stars packed into a really small space, usually 100 light years or less. You've got 100,000 stars in this case packed into only 84 light years of space. Now, what's really cool about the Great Cluster in Hercules is that it's so dense that sometimes the massive stars at the center of the cluster actually collide with one another, their material merges together, and they make a special new kind of star we call blue stragglers. These are stars that are going to be massive, so they're going to look blue in color, and they're going to be younger than the stars in the rest of the cluster. One important thing to know about clusters is that they form from the same nebulous cloud and all of the stars form at about the same time. So any star that you see in M13 is approximately the same age as any other star. But these blue stragglers are going to be a lot younger than the rest of the stars because they were formed in kind of a second round of star formation. They were formed when two stars that had already formed as massive stars collided together to make these younger, even larger stars in the cluster. The pictures on the bottom are just beautiful images of the great cluster in Hercules. You can see the colors here, the yellow and the red and the blue stars. And the image on the right is a little bit more zoomed out of the cluster. And it really gives you a sense of just how dense the star cluster is in the center. The center of the cluster is so bright because you have so many stars packed into this really small space. So the stars in M13 are really cool to look at and there's lots of neat science going on. But the Hercules cluster is also famous for a completely different reason. The Arecibo message a message we sent to a theoretical alien species in outer space was actually aimed at the cluster M13. So here's the background. In 1974, astronomers got together and decided that they were going to send a message to a theoretical alien species that might exist in outer space. We have no direct reason to believe the aliens are out there. We don't know where they are. But we figured, you know, we've got radio telescopes now. Why don't we try and send a message? Let the aliens know we're here. And it was decided that M13 would be the target. The thought process was there's a lot of stars there packed into a small space. So there's a higher likelihood for planet formation and maybe a higher likelihood that there are aliens on some of those planets within the star cluster. So astronomers used the Arecibo telescope down in Puerto Rico to send this message. That is the Arecibo message. Now, taking a look at that picture, you might recognize some things. There's kind of a, a humanoid figure here. Maybe you recognize this collection of dots. It's actually representing our solar system where we are the third rock from the sun there. If this blob is the sun. We're the third planet from the sun. And all of these other colorful things that you see are meant to represent other important things about our species. So the numbers 1 to 10 are at the top. The green and the purple here uh, represent things like oxygen, hydrogen, elements that are important to us, water, things like that. The blue is the double helix of DNA. The purple is representing the Arecibo radio telescope. The numbers next to the, or the pictures next to the person here are trying to show the height of a human and the global population at that time. So all of this information was sent um, via ones and zeros, you know, binary code, to a theoretical alien species within M13. Now, this is a really cool idea. I commend astronomers for doing this. But there's one important thing that they neglected to think about. M13 is really far away. M13 is about 25,000 light years away. Well, what does that mean about the Arecibo message? It means that the message is going to take 25 thousand years to reach the stars and the planets within the Hercules cluster. 
So if we imagine that there are aliens there, we're going to have to wait 25,000 years for them to get our message. And if they're super smart, they decipher our message and decide to send a message back, we're going to have to wait another 25,000 years before we receive the message back. So all in all, round trip, we're going to have to wait at least 50,000 years before we get any sort of response to the Arecibo message that was sent out. So great idea. But I definitely can't guarantee that, you know, 50,000 years from now, we'll be sitting here wondering about that message from M13. It might have been long forgotten about. We may not be here anymore. We might be so advanced that we've already traveled and checked for aliens in the star cluster. Who knows? 50,000 years is a long ways away. So again, I commend astronomers for this, it's super cool, but it would have been nice if we had sent the message to something a little bit closer so that we didn't have to wait so long for a possible response back from those aliens. The next constellation we're gonna talk about, Scorpius the Scorpion. So this is another great one that's sort of a connect to the dots picture. If you look in the upper right, we have our cartoon and a real photo in the bottom left where we've connected some of the stars together. There are three stars in a straight line that often represent the head of the scorpion. A bright red star called Antares, that's the heart of the scorpion, and a J-shaped tail that you can see in the images here. An important thing to note is that there's a difference between Scorpius and Scorpio. So Scorpius is actually the name of the constellation, the pattern of stars or the region of sky. Scorpio is the astrological term. So if you are a Scorpio, that means you were born at a time when the sun was within the constellation Scorpius. So try not and use Scorpius and Scorpio interchangeably. Scorpio is your zodiac sign. Scorpius is the constellation that's actually in the sky. So we're going to talk in a moment about Antares, that bright orange star that's the heart of the scorpion. And we're also going to end up talking about the Milky Way. You can see a lovely image of the Milky Way galaxy here passing through the tail of Scorpius. So here is Antares. You can see an actual photo of Antares here. This is another one of the stars that's close enough and big enough for us to actually directly image the surface of. The name Antares actually translates to opponent to Mars. And the reason the star has this name is that the planet Mars happens to be within the constellation of Scorpius frequently. And when Mars is near the star Antares in the sky, they look almost identical. They can be about the same brightness and they both have a distinct red color. So astronomers named this star opponent to Mars as an easy way to remind themselves that there's another star out there that looks like Mars that might trick you, especially if Mars actually is in that region of the sky. Antares is actually a red supergiant star. It's about 550 light years away, and it's fairly young. It's only 11 million years old. Now, Antares, just to kind of give you a sense of the size of a red supergiant star, I'm going to put up a little diagram here that shows um, our sun as well as Antares to scale. So here in the picture, I've got a little dot. That represents the size of our sun, 0.7 million kilometers wide. Here's another star, Arcturus. It's a giant star in the sky, about 20 million kilometers wide. And on the left here, you have Antares, 300 million kilometers wide. And just to show you how big that actually is, this dashed line here represents the orbit of Mars in our solar system. So if you replaced the sun with the star Antares, it would be so large that the edge of the star would expand out beyond the orbit of Mars. It's a truly humongous star. Now, as astronomers studied Antares, they actually realized that it's a true binary system. 
Antares has a much fainter standard star, we call those main sequence stars, that are actively fusing hydrogen into helium, but it's very difficult to see. Antares itself is so big and so bright that it's hard to see this fainter companion star right next to it. So we had to wait till we had really big, very precise telescopes to actually view this companion star near Antares. Another constellation you can look for in the same region of sky is Sagittarius, the centaur. So a centaur is a half man, half horse creature, and this centaur happens to also be an archer. So we imagine him like the cartoon shows at the bottom here. You've got your half man, half horse, pulling back a bow and arrow in the sky. Now, trying to connect the dots and make that pattern of a centaur pulling back a bow and arrow, that would take a lot of stars and probably be pretty tricky. But thankfully, the constellation of Sagittarius actually provides us with a much easier picture to look for, and that's the shape of a teapot. So the picture on the right here is showing you the bright stars in Sagittarius. And you can see that if you connect the dots, you have a spout, a top, and a handle for a teapot shape. So in the summertime sky, look towards the south. And you want to look towards the bottom of the sky if you're here in New York State. You'll find Sagittarius, some stars that kind of look like a teapot shape. Now, Sagittarius is really useful for helping us find the Milky Way galaxy. We just mentioned that the Milky Way galaxy passes through the tail of Scorpius, and Sagittarius is right behind the Milky Way. You can actually see it a little bit in this picture here. And Sagittarius also helps us find the exact center of the Milky Way as well. So let's briefly talk about where we are in the Milky Way galaxy and how these constellations that we've talked about help guide us to finding this faint band across our nighttime sky. Here's a nice cartoon showing our Milky Way galaxy. We live in this giant spiral armed galaxy that's about 100,000 light years in diameter. There's a super massive black hole in the center and within these spiral arms, there's at least 300 million stars, tons of planets, all sorts of cool stuff in the galaxy. We live down here, about halfway between the center and the edge of the Milky Way galaxy, right on the inner edge of an arm we call the Orion Spur. So here's this little arm here that comes out. We call that the Orion Spur. And the sun happens to be right on the inner edge. So we're about 25,000 light years from the center of the galaxy, halfway between the center and the edge. Now, why do we call it the Milky Way galaxy? Well, historically, astronomers looked up at the sky and thought they saw what looked like a river or a band of milk that moved across the sky. Kind of looks like a thin band of clouds going above your head. And in the summertime sky, it'll come up in the south, pass directly overhead, and head back down into the north. This image here, you can see we've got some of the bright stars labeled and the constellations labeled that we've looked at already. And the Milky Way is represented in such a way that shows about how bright it might be compared to the other stars. So here's our Milky Way galaxy. We have Antares, that's the heart of the scorpion. Down here, if you look closely, you can find the teapot for Sagittarius. And then you've got our three stars connected together for the summer triangle. So the Milky Way cuts through the tail of Scorpius, goes in front of Sagittarius, and then passes right through the summer triangle going right across Deneb, remember the tail of Cygnus the Swan. You can spot the Milky Way yourself, but you'll definitely need to be in somewhere that has pretty dark skies. If you happen to live near a, a suburb or in the middle of the city, it's probably going to be too bright. You'll probably have too much light pollution. But if you have a chance to go camping or you happen to live in a more rural area where there's not a lot of city lights, I encourage you to go outside in the summer and look up and see if you see what looks like a thin band of clouds moving through the triangle. That is going to be the Milky Way. 
So one of the things we can do is use Scorpius and Sagittarius to help us find the center of the galaxy. So what you want to do is look first for Scorpius, right? Find Antares, find that J-shaped tail, and kind of within the tail here is going to be the Milky Way galaxy. It's going to travel up, and then you can look for the teapot. Look for your teapot shape of Sagittarius, and there'll be a thin band that looks a lot like steam coming out of the teapot. That will help guide you towards the right position in the sky to look for the center of the galaxy. The galactic center, where that supermassive black hole is, sits right off the end of the two stars that make the spout in the teapot. So find those two stars in the spout and go out from them just a little bit. And the galactic center, we call it Sagittarius A star, is right about where that yellow dot is. Now, don't expect to see a black hole or a dark circle or anything like that. You won't see anything different when you're looking at the galactic center. What you'll see is the nebulous material that makes up the Milky Way. And it'll be a little bit darker there, not because of the black hole, but because there's so much dust and stellar material there that it's blocking a lot of the light from the stars that are orbiting the black hole in the center. So you've got a lot of gas and dust that's glowing, bouncing starlight, creating that band that is the Milky Way. And then in the galactic center, you're going to see a little bit of a darker region uh, and that's because the dust is blocking the starlight that's whirling around the black hole at the center. So again, you won't see anything unique when you're looking towards the galactic center, but you can kind of find it using the tail of Scorpius and the teapot shape of Sagittarius. So just kind of neat to know that you're looking towards the black hole in the center of our galaxy. The final thing I want to mention about the Milky Way galaxy is that it's not just visible in the summertime, but the summer is definitely the best time to look for it. Here we have two real photos of the night sky in the summer and winter aimed towards the Milky Way galaxy. Remember that we live inside the Milky Way, and when we are on the side of the sun that represents summertime for us, when we look in the evening out at night, we are facing the galactic center. When it's winter time, we're on the opposite side of the sun. That means we're looking in the opposite direction at night and we happen to be facing the outer edge of the galaxy. There's a lot more stars and a lot more material in the center of the galaxy as opposed to the outer edges of the galaxy. So when you're looking towards the galactic center, when it's summertime for us on Earth, you're going to see a lot more material representing the Milky Way in the sky. In the winter time, you just don't see as much. If you're in a very, very dark sky, it is possible to find the Milky Way in the winter cutting above your head. But it, again, it's a lot brighter in the summertime sky. You can see that very clearly in these pictures here. The Milky Way in the summer, you've got all of that dark banding, that dust, tons and tons of stars and some glowing white material scattering that starlight. The galactic center in this case is down towards the center. In the winter time, there's the Milky Way galaxy. You'll still see a, a thin band of cloud-like material. It's just not going to be as bright. So really, summertime is the most ideal time to get out and look for the Milky Way galaxy. Winter time, you can see it, but you've really got to have dark skies to be able to spot it. So I just wanted to summarize here everything we've talked about. We haven't covered all of the constellations in this picture, but this is a brief overview of what the southern sky in the summer is going to look like. We talked about the summer triangle. In this case, it's up here. Here's Vega. Uh, Deneb is up off the slide a little bit there, and Altair is down at the bottom, so there's our summer triangle. Hercules is just to the right of Vega. And then if we go down, we have Scorpius, there's the J-shaped tail. There's Sagittarius, the teapot. And if you look closely, you can see the Milky Way represented in the background as well. 
There are other interesting constellations like uh, Corona Borealis, the crown. We have Ophiuchus up here along with serpents, the snake that goes along with Ophiuchus. Here's Capricorn, the other uh, zodiac sign, another zodiac constellation. And uh, a big favorite of many of the young kids, Delphinus, the baby dolphin. Couple curved stars here that are meant to represent a baby dolphin right next to the summer triangle. So all sorts of great things to look for. Start by looking for the summer triangle and then see if you can go to the right for Hercules and then down towards the horizon for Scorpius and Sagittarius. If you're looking at the stars this summer, 2020, there's also going to be two planets visible. Both Jupiter and Saturn are going to be visible in the summer night sky as well. So I highly encourage you to step outside, see if you can find any of these star patterns, grab a pair of binoculars or small telescope to see some of the other interesting objects, and definitely look for the planets. Jupiter and Saturn will be very bright, very obvious, right low in the southern sky. The final thing I want to mention is the Perseid meteor shower. Every year we get excited for this big meteor shower that peaks around August 12th. The Perseid meteor shower is actually uh, caused by debris left behind by Comet Swift-Tuttle. You can see a picture of Comet Swift-Tuttle when it came around last in 1993 and a nice tail right behind the comet. That tail is filled with ice and gases and dust that are falling off of the comet and as the comet loops around the sun, it leaves behind this debris. And as the Earth moves into that debris that was left behind by the comet, we end up getting a meteor shower when all of this stuff starts crashing through our atmosphere, creating all those lovely shooting stars. To find the Perseid meteor shower, I should say to watch the Perseid meteor shower, you want to go out um, in the month of August, ideally around August 12th or 13th. And you want to look towards the northern part of the sky. We didn't talk too much about the northern part of the sky this time around, but you want to face north and you want to look just below the W constellation of Cassiopeia, right within the constellation of Perseus. This diagram is showing you what the sky looks like around 11 p.m. And as it gets later and later, like one, two in the morning, uh, Perseus is going to rise higher up in the sky and you'll be able to spot the Perseid meteors uh, with a lot better of a view because they'll be much higher in the sky. We expect the Perseid meteor shower to produce about 60 meteors per hour and uh, it changes every year. So as we get closer to the date, you'll probably see some news stories with an update about how many meteors you might expect. But 60 meteors an hour is pretty good. That's like one every minute. So you want to look towards the north, northeast after dark. Ideally, middle of the night is the best time to view the meteor shower. But if you're not really up for staying up till one and two in the morning, go outside after dark or, or even get up really early. If you get up at four or five a.m. before the sun comes up, you can look for the meteor shower at that time as well. So another great thing to check out in the summertime sky, along with all of the constellations and planets that we just talked about. Okay, so that is it for this lesson. I hope you enjoyed learning all about the stars and constellations visible in the summertime sky. Our next talk is called Our Star, the Sun. We're going to cover some basic information about the sun, talk a little bit about the space weather it creates, and we're also going to focus on this fairly new spacecraft called the Parker Solar Probe that's literally on its way to almost touching the surface of the sun. So we'll talk all about how this spacecraft works and what we hope to discover about the mysteries that our sun currently presents. So tune in next month for Our Star, the Sun.